Welcome back to the second lesson of the Zig Basics course. First of all, I want to thank all of you for your amazing comments. It seems that since the last time we met, we have gained 200 more subscribers. So welcome, and let's get started. Today, we're going to start with something very simple but incredibly important, which is creating an empty program. This might seem too basic, but understanding the fundamentals helps build a solid foundation for more complex concepts later on. We'll begin by creating a new main.zig file with absolutely no instructions, just an empty file. Now, let's try to compile the program using the Zig compiler. As you can see, we get an error telling us there's no entry point or main function. So, what is this main function that the compiler is talking about? I'm Vincent's brother. We're twins. That's right. The main function is the entry point of any program. Without it, the compiler doesn't know where to start executing the code. Let's go ahead and add this function to our main.zig file. We'll write the main function, but without any instructions inside it. Now, let's try to compile the program again. As you can see, we have a new error indicating that the main function is not public. But why does the main function need to be public? The reason is that there's a file in zig called start.zig that automatically calls the main function to start the program. But for this file to call main, the function must be public, meaning it's accessible from outside the file in which it's defined. Now I have several questions about this scene. Why does the start.zig file use the name root.zig instead of main.zig to access our file, which is the starting point? Isn't our file the starting point? So doesn't having another file calling our file make the other file as the starting point and not our file? Okay, let's clarify the naming aspect first. The start file attempts to import our main file, but how does it know the name of the file in the first place? As you know, it's not necessary for the main file to be named main.zig, but that's my personal preference. When we write the build command, we include the name of our file, which tells the compiler exactly what our main file is. However, the start file doesn't know this, so you can think of it this way. When the compiler builds the program, it creates a file called root.zig, and the purpose of this file is to contain the instructions from the main file to run the program. After that, the compiler runs the start file, which tries to import the root file. So, the name here is a reference to the fact that the root file is indeed our main file indirectly, but it serves to unify access to it regardless of the actual file name. Now, regarding the question, why does the start.zig file exist in the first place? Well, to understand this, you need to grasp the concept of the life cycle of the program. This concept involves three mechanisms or stages for initializing, executing, and terminating a program. When a program starts, it needs to communicate with the operating system to request permission to open, ask for space to temporarily store data during the program's runtime, request some operations to be performed on the CPU to run the program, and finally, request the cleanup and freeing of memory after the program terminates or when it's no longer needed. This ensures the user has a safe experience when using the program, as they won't have to worry about something called memory leaks, which refer to memory not being cleaned up after it's no longer needed, thereby occupying unnecessary space on the system and leading to increased resource consumption without cause. All these tasks and more happen automatically every time the program opens and closes. We didn't write the code that does this. The language, along with the compiler, provides these assumptions essential functions and manages them on our behalf to simplify and speed up the programming process, following the principle of don't reinvent the wheel. So you can imagine that the program first goes through an initialization stage where it communicates with the operating system and requests resources from the device to run the program. After that, it runs the start file, which then imports the root file and attempts to call the main function. At this stage, the second stage begins, which is the execution phase, where the code we've written is executed. Finally, the termination phase begins to end the application, clean up the memory, and free the system resources. All right, folks, I know this lesson was a bit shorter than the last one, but trust me, sometimes less is more. But just to make sure we're all on the same page, let me introduce my friend, Max. Hey, Max. Uh, hi, thanks for that great explanation, but honestly, I didn't understand anything. Like, start file? Root file? Are we building a tree or something? Can you explain it in a way that even I, Max the Magnificent, can get? All right, all right, Max. Let me give you an example you'll understand. Imagine you're in a pizza restaurant, right? The start file is like the waiter. It's not actually making the pizza, but it's the one taking your order and bringing it to the chef in the kitchen, who is your main function. The chef, main function makes the pizza based on your order. And once it's done, the waiter takes it back to you. So the start file is like the middleman, making sure the right pizza gets made. But it's the chef who's really cooking things up. Oh, I get it now. So the root file is like the kitchen and the start file is the waiter. Got it. Wait, but who's eating the pizza? Well, that's you, Max. The user is always the one enjoying the final result. 
And that's how programs work, folks, like ordering pizza. But next time, we're going even deeper. We're going to explore the actual hardware behind the scenes, the CPU, RAM, operating system, and more. Understanding the machines we're programming on will help you write even more efficient code. So get ready for an exciting ride into the world of hardware and system components. Oh, I almost forgot to tell you that we now have a Discord server where we can discuss all the topics, ask questions, get help, and build a supportive and healthy community throughout this learning journey. It's also a great place to share knowledge and experiences with others. Also, we've set up our very own space on GitHub. We are working on creating a text version of each lesson and publishing them as documents, along with the source code when available, as an open book for you to learn at your own pace and level. I want to apologize for the shorter video length today, but I've been dealing with some unexpected issues recently. However, I fully intend to keep going strong. So see you in the next episode.